Roy Wright was a late starter in football terms, first turning his hand to the game as a 16-year-old with North Q in 1945. But such was his natural ability that he found himself at Punt Road just a year later. He hadn't yet come to terms with his huge frame and still lacked coordination and experience at the highest level, playing just 21 games in his first four years at the club, which was already blessed with champion Brownlow medalist Bill Morris as its number one ruckman. Former teammate and curator of the Richmond Football Club Museum, Ron Rifle. Well, he was a ball player. He was uh, he made a uh, a craft. I think he he, he idolised Bill Morris, as, uh, who was more or less uh, keeping him out of the real number one spot in the Richmond team. Uh, and Bill was a, a beautiful palmer of the ball, and Roy sort of adapted his game along the same lines. And he he didn't use his weight as um, much as some people would have liked, but. Um, but when he went through, he, he was still a hard man to stop because he was 16 stone and 6 foot 2. You know, he, he was a pretty big man for that era. With Morris's retirement at the end of 1951, Roy finally received the chance to grab a regular senior slot, having already tried four times to get a clearance to Hawthorne. Richmond coach Jack Dyer couldn't understand why a 16 stone mountain of a man with a 10 inch hand span didn't inflict more damage on the opposition. But that was Roy's gentlemanly way and he soon became known throughout the football world as the gentle giant. Roy was a gentleman. Uh, he, he treated everybody exactly the same, whether you're a third 18 player or a jack die. You know, he, he was very approachable and treated everybody uh, the same. And I can speak uh, more highly of anybody. Former teammate and eventual successor as number one ruckman, Neville Crowe. Oh look, Roy, Roy was just one of those guys that played scrupulously fair football and he worked on the theory and I, uh, you know, I picked up on it myself because I was no tough guy. Uh, but at the end of the day he said that while if he was getting the ball and guys were banging him and kicking him and doing all that sort of stuff, uh, he felt that he was a much better chance to get the ball and do something with it either in his palming or marking around the ground and, and, and playing. So uh, bear in mind he was, he was certainly hard at the ball uh, but he wasn't the sort of guy that would go around punching and kicking and uh, scratching or anything of that nature. But there was uh, an incident, I think it's been fairly well recorded, but it bears uh, uh, going into, uh, uh, and this is going back to uh, uh, my first year, 1957, maybe even the year before, 56, and he um, uh, he was playing on uh, Skinny Martin, Brian Skinny Martin, Mick Mar Martin's dad, who died only, what, made it about three weeks ago, um, and uh, Big uh, Skinny was giving Roy a real working over, you know, uh, donging him and scraping him with the stops and the centre bounces and things like that, and... Uh, Roy wasn't too happy about this and uh, Harry Beitzel uh, was the umpire at the time and uh, I must confess back in those days umpires were men, men and not maggots so uh, uh, he saw this happening to Roy and after a goal was uh, was kicked he said as they were running back to the centre uh, out of the corner of his mouth um, Roy I'm giving you one shot so the ball was bounced Harry ran backwards fell over and Roy ran straight through Brian Martin uh, broke three of his ribs and uh, you know uh, game over so uh, you know uh, gentle giant sometimes Roy immediately blossomed once given the chance to play regular senior football and quickly became the game's premier ruckman, winning the Brownlow medal in 1952 and again in 1954. He went on to win four club best and fairest and represented Victoria on 18 occasions before a knee injury prematurely ended his career in 1959 after 195 games for his beloved Tigers. To see Roy at full flight here with booming drop kicks or punt, the torpedo punts down straight down the ground um, to Poulter who was the centre half forward, they, this ground wasn't big enough for those two blokes, so two kicks in the, from the back line it was in the, through the goals and uh, it's to see him work with Bill Wilson and later Ron Branton, it was really classic with his palming and uh, his ability to move the ball to them, you know, it just was terrific to watch. Oh gosh, in my time of watching the Tigers, I had the good fortune of being uh, you know, a Richmond supporter before I was actually uh, uh, came down here to play. And my idol uh, was uh, Bill Morris, who wore number five, whose number I was very proud to receive later on. But I watched Roy evolve. Bear in mind, I was only a little kid at that time. And uh, you know, Roy's got a rank up there at uh, you know, uh, four best and fairest and two Brownlow medals uh, and 195 games. It doesn't get much better than that, uh, given that he played quite a few, of course, in the reserves as he was trying to battle his way into the senior side. Uh, so uh, he'd have to go down as one of the all-time greats as his presence in the, uh, the team of the century and, of course, the, uh, the Hall of Fame uh, honour that he received as well. So he's uh, right up there in the, uh, the top guys in the club over, over its history. Roy was an inaugural inductee to both the AFL and Richmond Halls of Fame and unquestionably one of the greatest to ever pull on the yellow and black. Roy Wright.
forever remembered as a true gentleman, the great Gentle Giant.